I would like to honor and acknowledge that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuits, and Metis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First People of this land. I join you today from Toronto today, which is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize the work done by nine Indigenous institutes in this province. The Indigenous institutes are a key pillar of Ontario's post-secondary ecosystem. And as a member of the sector, I want to recognize and share their incredible leadership for Indigenous owned and led education. Uh, if you want to learn more about them, uh, my colleague will again be sharing some additional uh, you know, links, uh, which you can take a look at. Uh, so let's get started. So hello everyone and welcome to the e to eCampus's third digital transformation community of practice webinar on empowering student teams to support the knowledge needs of cloud technology users at McMaster University. My name is Monica Shah, and I am a Digital Transformation Associate in the Research and Foresight team at eCampus Ontario, where I work primarily on running the leadership for Digital Transformation micro-credential and also supporting other cross-functional uh, cross programs. Uh, I have been supporting, the digit, uh, supporting digital learning in various roles for close to, I would say, 15 years now. I also have my colleague Janine and other amazing team members from eCampus Ontario joining us today to ensure the smooth running of the ses session. And it gives me great pleasure to be, be moderating today's webinar and to introduce our presenters for today. So let's get started. So our first presenter is Krista Morrison. Uh, Krista currently fills the role of business system specialist as part of the collaboration, productivity, and cloud enablement team at McMaster University. Uh, her work focuses on supporting you know, the different stakeholders, the faculty, students, researchers, and staff in their adoption and use of cloud technology uh, to enable and foster effective collaboration, contemporary ways of doing, and encourage transformative innovation. Uh, Krista has an amazing background in journalism, higher education, teaching and learning, and the design and development of digital learning spaces and platforms. And most recently, she's been part of the EDICO's Horizon, uh, Horizon Report on Teaching and Learning Panel 2023, and many other panels and groups in higher education. In this webinar, Krista will be discussing McMaster's University's quality management process to address the knowledge needs of cloud technology users, including the approach to forming the Gen Z student team to support their initiatives. I think that's so amazing because students are such an important stakeholder for all of us. Additionally, she will delve into the utilization of uh, intelligent uh, agents, uh, applications like GPT-4, and what is very interesting is provide a live demonstration of the SharePoint widget uh, that they have created in the Microsoft Teams app. Uh, I must also take this opportunity to add that Krista uh, was, the, was part of our first cohort for the Leadership for DX program and uh, one of the most active participants. Uh, not just that, we also have two of her amazing students who will be co-presenting today's webinar. Uh, so Paul Duan is a third year computer science undergraduate student and is working part-time as a project assistant at McMaster's uh, University's Technology Service. Yeah, I got that right, UTS, where he supports the adoption and use of a wide range of technologies, including Microsoft 365. He is also an active member of McMaster Information Technology Student Advisory Committee. We also have Chanel Morrison, who is a final year biology undergraduate student and she too is working part-time as a project assistant at McMaster University's uh, UTS service, which is the University Technology Service, where she also supports the adoption and use of a wide range of cloud technologies, including apps like SharePoint. And she's also a member of the Generative AI Task Force at McMaster. 
Uh, so I just want to take a few minutes before I pass the baton to our uh, amazing um, speakers for today. Uh, for anyone who's new to eCampus Ontario, I just want to inform you all that eCampus is a provincially funded non-profit organization that leads a consortium of the province's publicly funded colleges, universities, and indigenous institutes. And our purpose is to advance the use of education technology and digital learning environments. Our membership includes 53 institutions in this province. And our members are faculty, administrators, students, support services, teaching assistant and learners. Sorry, I just have a bad throat today. So we welcome anyone involved in post-secondary education in Ontario. Ontario to come find the right opportunity for them. Just one more slide. Um, so we all know that higher education is in the era of digital transformation, uh, whether institutions are redefining how we teach them. And when we talk about DX, it's complex, you know, it is not just about adopting a new technology. Uh, what we are looking when we talk about DX is to transform you know, an institution's operation, strategic directions and value proposition. And at eCampus, we are very, very passionate about digital transformation. And our, our one of our main aims is to provide, uh, you know, the higher education se sector by providing, you know, digital by design platforms, programs and services. And as I was just saying, um, one of the programs that we've created, the Leadership for Digital Transformation is one of our programs to support. That said, we understand that DX is not a straight path, it's a journey. And the objective behind creating a DX community of practice is to have a platform, you know, where we can have these meaningful conversations around digital transformation. So for the remainder of today's webinar, we will hear from Krista, supported by Paul and Chanel, who will take us through how, I, if I get it correctly, that Discover app in Microsoft Teams is supporting the knowledge needs of technology users at the institution. So without wasting any more further time, I will stop sharing my screen and it's over to you, Krista and your team. Thank you, Monica. I've just shared um, in the chat with you as well, McMaster's uh, land acknowledgement. And I also just want to say what it means to me is that um, I acknowledge that we are on a land where we have a shared responsibility to do things in a responsible manner. And that same responsibility um, we apply when we think about how we support um, the adoption and use of cloud technologies at McMaster. So, um, I'm going to start sharing my screen with you. Um, let me hope I get it right. So if you can just tell me, do you see my um, PowerPoint first slide? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, wonderful. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is sharing with you how we empower student teams to help us support the knowledge needs of technology users. Now, what do I what I mean when I say we look at this through that responsible lens? What we are trying to say is that one, when we create a support service for our users, we want them to know this is the single source of truth. You don't have to go and Google or go to YouTube or somewhere else. When you use this technology, and in this case, we're going to look at Microsoft 365 and Zoom and how we support um, our users in adopting and using those apps. We want them to know this is where you will find the most important information. We're putting it right front and center. These are the terms of use. This is the information you need to uh, take into account. Krista, just, just one sec. Uh, yeah. What we do see is your Chrome tab. Is that what you want to share? Sorry, we do not see the slide deck. No, sorry. Let me let me do it again. One moment. Yeah. No worries. It it kind of happens. <laughs> yeah. So it still shows it in my screen. So I hope I'm gonna get it correct. So. Sh 
sharing my screen, selecting screen number one. Okay. Uh, do you see it? Uh, no, we still do see. Okay, we see it. Yeah, we do see it now. Yeah, you see it? Yeah, this one? all good. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so what 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 we mean by that is that you know the technology needs um, users will first and foremost know how to use the, the technology in a responsible manner so know the terms of use know what to consider for privacy and security and to make sure that the way we use it is fully inclusive so know about the accessibility needs um, and then literacy you know no, knowing how to use it and make the most of it to enable their work. So the learning resources and then being human centric, making sure that if they can't find all of that, that they can connect with the human being. So what we are going to share with you then in this presentation is how do we share this knowledge exactly? What does it look like? Uh, who's involved in putting this together? How did we design this? because we are talking about 70,000 um, license holders here. Um, then I'm going to introduce to you um, the teams of students that actually helped um, enable this. Um, and we're going to go through the quality management process. So how do we make sure that you know, we do things up to a standard where we also model how we would like people to use the technology. And then after the slides that we share, we will give you an introduction of what does it look like when I go to Teams? How do I find that resource, which is our Discover app? And what does a tour of the site look like? But let me first show you what I'm talking about. So this is what it is. This is a SharePoint site that we have designed. Um, as you can see, right in the center, the important information. What are the terms of use? Privacy, security, et cetera. On the left, they have access to learn how to use the apps, learn which apps are available to them. On the right-hand side, if I can't find the information that I'm looking for here, where can I find human beings? Where can I book a consultation with specialists on the support team? Where can I find communities of practice where 24 seven, I can ask a question and learn from others? Um, and where, where can I connect with the live chat of the client service team um, if I need technical help? So, um, that was wonderful. We've created this site. It's a searchable SharePoint site, so it's easy to quickly search for something on the site. But then how do people find the site? So that we figured out by creating an app which can be pinned within Teams on the left navigation bar. So this site is now pinnable within Teams. You can pop out the screen or you can just use it in um, within Teams when you are working on Teams. Okay, so this is wonderful. Now people know where to find the single source of truth, where to connect with people who can help them. They know how to get there because it's right there in Teams. But guess what? Microsoft and Zoom is rolling out updates all the time. We might make big announcements. We might, um, you know, introduce new terms of service. Um, we, we might add new learning resources. How would people know that we've done that? And so the solution we found for that is by making use of the news widget in SharePoint. So we added now um, short news articles, which Chanel will tell you more about a bit later on, but this is used to help people know what is new. It won't take them more than um, five minutes to read, and often we write it in a format that will take them only one minute to read, and um, that's the only thing they ever have to keep their eyes on, to know what's new and what's important. Um, and so I think, you know, Chanel, let me um, give over to you now, and you can talk a little bit more about, you know, what that news feature is and how it works. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Krista. 
So yeah, so what we do is we make use of this news widget in SharePoint. And now what the news widget allows us to do is it allows us to create articles that are easy to understand. So we make sure to not include more information than can uh, be read in less than five minutes. And these articles are also created in a uniform format so that our users always know what to expect when reading the news articles. And later in the presentation, I'll take you through our quality framework process um, where we make sure that the articles are accessible and contain reliable information on where the update works best. Um, so for example, if it only works on Windows or if it only works on Mac. And if you wanna move over to the next slide. Um, so, but what if the users don't go to the SharePoint site or they also don't open it up in Microsoft Teams? Well, the news widget actually allows us to send a news digest to users and we have the ability to choose how often we want to send this and also to who we want to send this to. So at this point, because all students, staff, faculty, and researchers have M365 licenses at McMaster, we send it once a week. And I will now hand it over to Paul to tell you more about how we support our users. All right, thanks, Juno. So this is a feature that we added this summer that we believe can help many people. It's a virtual tour bus that take us to five stops. At each stop, we will introduce them to a component or area of our SharePoint site. For example, on the next slide, there is a, there is a screenshot at our fourth stop. We introduce them to where to book consultations and where to find human beings that they can communicate with. It starts with the idea, how should we help new users get familiar with the SharePoint site? especially for the thousands new first year students who will join McMaster this new semester. We came up with the idea of making an interactive web tour for our site and fortunately, we found a web tour widget that we can help us do the job. With the help of this kind of immersive web tour, new users can get familiar with our site quickly without the process of going through the site themselves. Now back to Krista. Thanks, Paul. So yeah, so Paul showed you, you know, how even new users, no one, someone who's never used the site could quickly get an introduction and start using the site and get value. But how do we know this is actually all worth it? Well, we have the analytics behind the site and we actually go through an annual process of reaching out to our users and finding out exactly what are they finding useful. We review the whole site um, every 12 months and add more features to it or more content according to frequently asked questions in the communities of practice or you know, just the feedback that we receive. Also, very important, we do have a please submit feedback button on the site so we can get feedback um, constantly from our users. What's, what do we know what, what we are doing? We are, what we are doing is we help them discover what's available and what's possible. We help them to learn how to use the collaboration productivity tools um, to reach their desired outcomes. And when they become part of our communities of practice, we've got one for SharePoint users, one for uh, Power App users, we've got one for um, class teams, those who are using teams for teaching, etc. The users are telling us what they are find the most useful is what, what gets shared in an Ask Anything Year channel where people will come and see what are others asking about the use of this tool. And they often find inspiration and ideas and shortcuts and hacks um, by just keeping their eye on what others are asking and the answers to that. This also helped them to stay up to date with new features and announcements. And the way we encourage people um, to make sure they do this is pin the app in Teams and once a week, when you drink your coffee, just go and click open the app and look at those news articles. We never share more than five articles a week 
to make sure that we, you know, take into uh, account this digital fatigue that all of us um, are, are suffering. Um, what we also do by creating this resource is we make people part of a 24 seven community of practice. So we know by now that we have about 28,000 unique users. It's really important to us to find the ways of um, introducing the site to the thousands of new students um, every year. And with the help of Paul and the team this summer, you saw we, we uh, found a way of quickly, you know, showing them the value they can find there. We know that we have about 5,000 visits to the site on average, um, more in the first few weeks of every school term, or when there's a massive change like the migration from uh, classic stream to stream on SharePoint. We've had more than 200,000 visits to the site so far. Um, and here's something really interesting. Part of the analytics you can get on SharePoint is you can see when people are using it and you know which articles um, and pages they click on most. And what I find really interesting is that the McMaster users start visiting the site about 5 a.m. in the mornings. And that goes right through till after midnight until 2 a.m. So this, this is re really like that 24 seven space. And what I also find really puzzling is how many users are actually using this on New Year's Eve as well. So yeah, I think, you know, all of this shows us this truly bring um, value to the users. Now you might ask me, so how did you do this, Krista? Well, how did we put this in place? How do we ma maintain it? And how do we make sure we improve on this service? And what you see in front of you is the little logos that our student teams that we hire every summer created to be representative of the team of that summer. We hire four students. Um, every summer, making sure that they come from, you know, a range of different um, faculties, people with a range of different interests and passions and ambitions, and really try and find the most diverse team with, I would say, two of the most important skills that we are looking for is people who, um, like or are interested in coding and new ways of creating and then people who are very comfortable with new ways of communicating the multimedia skills and what's what I found also in teaching in programs was that there is just a massive difference between what Generation Z can do and how they do things, how they learn, how they create, how they communicate versus, you know, student groups that I worked, um, um, you know, or, or was teaching as well. So for me, this group of students really stand out. And the, the beauty of this is that the majority of students we do have in our higher education institutions are from this generation today. And the majority of the users of these technologies on our campuses are from this generation today. So it just makes sense to leverage their way of thinking, their way of doing when we create the support. Now, just to come back to these little logos, we came up with the name UTAC in the first summer. Um, the short for University Technology Assistance Group. And as you can see, they created this little tag. We were all still working from home and, you know, everything was online. And UTAC would say, oh, you just tag us and we'll be there to support you and help you. The second year, we, we put a lot of effort in helping everybody transition from fully online to be in contact with each other again while they are going to, you know, work and teach and learn in a hybrid fashion. And they decided to put that little figure representing, you know, the human touch uh, in their logo. Third year, 23, 
When they decided to create their logo, what did they do? Well, as um, we are in 2023, they decided to take all our values and, um, you know, the mission of McMaster to help create a brighter world and input it in a GPT tool and had the image created for them. So it's just interesting when I look back at the history of how our teams evolve with not only what's happening in um, our lives in terms of technology, but you know the ways of working. The last logo is for our project assistants, which is usually one or two of the students that work with us for four months in summer that continue after summer to help us um, maintain the site and do our work. But let's have a look at these students. As you can see, um, we include students from a variety of programs. We make sure that we include students that are undergraduate and are in graduate programs. We make sure that we include students that are native Canadian students and international students. The same thing happened in 2022 and in 2023, we followed that same approach. Also, in terms of the work we do in summers, they don't only review the resources. We are part of a wonderful um, collaboration, productivity, um, and cloud enablement team on on and you know at McMaster. And this team has got a lot of responsibilities and a lot of projects they're trying to see through in summer. So before summer, we reach out to our team and ask where can you benefit from the input and support of the students that we will be hiring this summer. And so we have this list of projects. And then we once we, we selected our students, we match their own passions, ambitions, um, and skills with the projects that we have. So I always say, you know, if you if you match if you match someone's passions and talents and interests with the work they do, you build a, a natural momentum to get things done. Um, what we also do is we create a little community of UTAC members. So every summer, at the beginning of summer, um, I like to invite some of the students and just connect with a new team to give them an idea of what was your summer like with this team? What was it like working on this? And how can I make the most of my experience? And then at the end of summer, we have an on-campus reunion where we bring all the students together and they can share more with each other and build their own network in terms of, you know, what was this experience like? How did I benefit from it? And for us, it's wonderful to see how our students going through um, this experience start filling leadership roles um, in other areas. So how do we onboard and set up our team? We rely a lot on uh, the tools that we are um, supporting. And so Microsoft Teams play a big role. On the left-hand side, you can see that the channels that we create um, corresponds with projects that we might be working on this summer. Um, we also make sure that we um, create our teams always with about our team uh, channel. And if you look on the right hand side, it gives you an idea of how we assign roles. So every student right from the first meeting um, takes on a role. Someone will become the calendar manager and be responsible for the scheduling um, all our meetings. Someone will become the teams manager and make sure that we add a planner board, that we add the project list, <clears throat> that we set up the team in a way that will make it easy for people to find what we are doing here and how we use it. Um, as a lot of these projects we're working on, we are working with um, people not only in the bigger university technology services team, but also people and other teams on campus. So we wanna make sure that when we add them to this team where we collaborate, also they understand who's got which responsibility, how are we making use of this, and what are the principles um, that, that we adhere to. Um, 
Then you can also see on the left hand side, maybe channel number four, GIF Wars. This is one of the um, one of the little tactics that we have to make sure that we check in with the team and know how people feel about what we do. So every Friday we have the short Jeff War meeting, uh, Jeff War uh, meeting. And okay, if you say Jeff or Give, this last group of uh, UTAC members told me that they don't say Jeff or Jeff; they call it GIF. So, okay, I, I learn all the time as well that um, we don't all communicate in the same way, but it's important to know, um, you know, what it means when we say something. The Jeff Wars basically is a 10-minute meeting at the end of the week where we reflect on the work of the week. We create a notice within a team channel and it poses a question, something like, how did you feel about the eCampus Ontario presentation this week. Something that we all collaborated on, something we worked on uh, this week. And then each member of the team gets a few minutes to choose a GIF and share it. Then all of us go and vote. We can react to the GIFs with, you know, the, um, the laugh symbol or the love symbol, but we all vote with a like, the thumbs up. And then the person who got the most likes that person win that, that week's GIF war. But what it really does, it opens up the conversation about how did you feel about things? And we keep our tabs on that. So it's easy for me to, to gauge whether the team are anxious about something, do they feel proud about something, can we do more of this, et cetera. We also have a meeting in the middle of our week, which we call our happy hour, and that is usually 30 minutes, um, and depending on whether we worked in a hybrid fashion or fully online, it could be an activity on campus or off campus, but it really is about spending time together as a team and focusing on something that makes us feel happy in that moment and leaving that meeting feeling happy, feeling proud about things that we are doing, uh, what we have learned, our learning journey, et cetera. So I think those two things are something that I would really like to highlight for those of you who are thinking of um, hiring your own student teams. Then at the top of this screen is what you can see uh, has been added to the general channel. So you can see we have a notebook that we are using for notes. We also use this to capture any documentation for any of the projects that we use so that we keep all of the information in one place. And this become a really useful archive for our broader team after the summer to refer back to work that has been done, people that were involved, you know, from other areas in the, on campus, et cetera, things that we need to follow up on. Um, as you can see now that we also uh, meet, you know, uh, online and on campus, we make sure that even the work we do within, um, you know, um, a personal setting, we add to the notes. Then we have a planner board where we schedule and, um, you know, assign the tax, tasks and keep a track of that. We have, we make use of lists to track all our projects. So that's if you look at the top of the screen now. Um, and then um, on in terms of those projects, so these extra projects that we are doing, we are making sure that every student um, gets an opportunity to take on a leadership role. So we um, assign one of the students to take the lead on those projects, and we might have one or two or three of the other students supporting those projects as well and work with them. And then, of course, we make sure we know who's taking time off in summer and we can um, schedule our work around that. Okay, so to get move on to the next slide, which is not advancing at the moment for me. Ah, okay. So now you might ask, so, okay, that is wonderful, Krista. Now we know what you've put in place. Now we know who helped your team doing this. What did that process look like in terms of the design? So we followed a design thinking process, which once again puts 
the diverse user base that we are supporting right at the front of the process. We have um, interviewed, um, I think we've conducted about 151 interviews um, with different stakeholders on campus. We've done an environmental scan, learning what other what other um, institutions have done. We also looked at how K-12 support their users. Um, we look at private companies. We look at uh, what universities in Australia and England, everywhere is doing to learn what others have done and discovered so we don't reinvent the wheel. We also sent out a survey and understanding what exactly is it that people try to find. Um, what is it that they want to learn? How do they want to learn it? Then we analyze the needs. We draw um, insights from that. Um, the design guidelines became very apparent. And then we followed that guidelines and we created um, the first draft site. We shared it with many of the groups within um, our university technology services for their feedback and input. Um, and then we have tested the site and launched it. Um, so in my next slide, you will see that, you know, part of the things that people told us about. And so the, the more bold the type of the feedback here, the more users actually express that as what they are looking for. And as you can see, you know, it was very easy for us when we started getting back the feedback and analyze to see what people are looking for. And as you've seen already what we created, you can see how we've responded to that. So looking at all of this, we are, you know, we, we said, okay, let's sort it into buckets. What exactly are they talking about when they when they you know, give us all this feedback. And then we could see that it was all about the content, about how we present the content, how we deliver the content. What is that experience when I, when, you know, what people expect to find? They told us, we wanna feel like it's an inclusive space. It's not only a space for people who are, you know, already comfortable with technology. It's not a place only for, you know, uh, instructors. Um, this, they, they, they told us, they want to feel safe. They want to feel comfortable. They want to feel excited about this. This should look modern, et cetera. What were the things they told us? Please avoid this. And what exactly did they expect to find? So, Looking at all of that, it was really, really easy for us to see what it is that we have to put front and center in our design and in the way that we support our users. You can see, keep things simple, make sure there's human connection, um, make sure we can trust this. So what does trust mean? Trust for us means that people are actually aware of what we've created, that people um, trust what they find there, that if we tell them this is trustworthy information, that this is easy to use, that this is where you can connect with a human being, then those things should be true. Um, and so that is why it's really important for us to review that on a constant basis and on a regular basis and make sure we built on that trust. So yeah, um, this is basically, you know, when I look at this and when I see how we support other users on campus now creating SharePoint sites, I, I can basically tell you that you can take these design principles and probably apply it to any kind of support and any kind of SharePoint site that you develop. But I'm handing over to Chanel now and she'll share more with you on how we built on that trust and making sure that what we deliver is of quality. Thanks, Chanel. Yes, thank you, Krista. So now I'd like to take a few moments to walk you through our streamlined process for handling the news updates. So every week, our CPS team and UTS management, including the client service desk and security team, review the latest news updates, then after careful consideration, selected updates are handed over to the multimedia assistant. 
The multimedia assistant then thoroughly reads through the news update, conducts any supplementary research if needed, and performs comprehensive testing on various devices, including both Mac, iOS, and Android. And this testing helps determine where the update works best, ensuring a seamless user experience. Now, once the multimedia assistant has gathered all the necessary information, they get to work crafting a concise and easy to understand five minute news article. And finally, the finalized article is then published on our Discover and Learn SharePoint site for all our McMaster users to access. So by following this knowledge sharing framework, we guarantee that our news updates are accurate, rele relevant, and readily accessible to our audience. And now moving on to the next slide. Um, so now I'll present to you our quality framework that we employ during the creation of these five minute news articles. So first, to ensure clarity, we streamline the article by removing any unnecessary words or sentences. Next, additional information such as how to use steps or further official Microsoft support links are included as necessary. Um, now, when clear instructions on how to use the feature are not available online, we rely on GPT-4 tools to break down the steps for us. However, due to the possibility of inaccurate information, we always make sure to test the steps ourselves before including it into the article. Similarly, if we cannot find a suit suitable stock image to use, we utilize Bing Image Creator or Microsoft Designer to generate the image ourselves. So as you can see in the image here on the right, I prompted Bing Image Creator with a specific description to show students in a university library with laptops, tablets, smartphones, windows, and shadows from a sunny day all together in one picture. And now I'd just like you to take a moment and appreciate how wonderful this tool is that it could so perfectly produce this image for me. And now I'll hand it over to Paul. Thanks, Chanel. So, <clears throat> on top of our QA processes, we also standardize our work. Take the logo in terms of visual components as an example. We are trying to use the same logo to get users used to it and to flatten their learning curve. So when they see the when they see the same logo, they will have a general idea of what it is. Guidelines are something else we provide. We have a community of practice guidelines, which you can fo follow to create a community of practice team. Therefore, when user, therefore, user can have similar experience in different community of practice teams. And also, based on our experience of creating and maintaining this site, we start to think, since we have gone through these challenges, the others probably have to gone through as well. Th thus, we also create some guidelines for how to create and maintain SharePoint sites. For example, we are creating a design principle document for people. A good site design can increase user experience as well as helping us with information, information sharing. In addition, one part of our new tech journey this summer was to automate our process and workflows. We have already automated the license management process, which we used to spend lots of time on it doing repetitive work and the book of training sessions in terms of how we gather information better. With the help of this automated process, we standardize our workflows and save lots of time. Now back to Krista. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so now you might say, wow, you've put all of that together. Um, you know, you've got all these processes sorted out. You share all these good practices with other um, M365 users on campus. What's next? Are there things that you are not doing that you already know should be done as well? And this is what we know, what we do know is that our users that come to the site are saying, okay, this is fantastic. I know where to find all of this, but is there a place where I can just ask a question um, 
that link me to maybe frequently asked questions and I can quickly get that answer back. Well, our live chat, on, um, which is part of our client service desk, um, has got a knowledge base. But as we are in the process at the university to review what live chat we are using, how this will be used and changes that will be made to this. And as we know that we are now entering this era where, you know, other assistants or co-pilots, you know, could probably part of a SharePoint site or any of the other apps. This is something that we will most probably review during our next massive review, which would be next summer. So yes, I'll leave you with that. That is probably uh, where things are going for us in terms of what next steps could look like. So now I just wanna say thank you very much. Um, I know this is a lot of information, but um, if you have any questions, you are welcome to reach out to us um, and you will find all of us um, on LinkedIn. And Monica, if you want, I can yes. stop sharing this presentation and then I can just maybe quickly give a demo of what the experience looked like. Um, sure. Uh, so so we have around 10 minutes and I think the demo will be a great thing. But uh, I do not see any questions posted yet. But you know what? Uh, we Anybody in the seminar, if you want to ask a question, please unmute your mic and you could ask Krista and the team any, any questions that you would have at this moment. And uh, uh, if we have the questions, we can always stop the recording. Or uh, would you would you like to give the uh, demo? How long would that take, Krista? Oh, no, this is like five seconds. OK, so let's start with the demo, and then we can stop the recording. OK, yeah. so I'm just going to share with you my screen. And what you should see now is Teams open in front of you. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. yeah. So this is it. So I'm in Teams and, you know, my McMaster tenant. And so what you see now is that team that I showed earlier uh, about team. So I'm, you know, I'm a user yet McMaster. I might have other teams that I have working, da, da, da. And now how do I find Discover? I just click on the navigation bar on Discover on the left-hand side and the site opens up right in front of me. So while I'm having my coffee in my hand, I can quickly come and, oh yeah, I see there are new updates. And, you know, I could quickly maybe want to read about it and, you know, open the article. And as you can see, it's gonna take me literally one or two minutes to know about this update that could have you know, an impact on my experience using these apps. Um, and then what does the tour look like? So as you can see, if you're a new user here, you can come and just see, go on this five bus stops where it will tell you what you will find on the site. And literally that is it. There's your tour done. So that's all I wanted to share with you in terms of how seamless and beautiful and connected and transformative the experience is for our users.